Hello and welcome back. This session is all about summer projects and how to navigate time off. Summer is a time when many musicians find themselves without the structures and external motivators that um, keep them going, learning new repertoire, practicing hard during the rest of the year. So we wanted to share some thoughts about how to take advantage of those summer months if you find yourself with a little bit more time on your hands to invest in your playing. I am Karen Bulmer, and I am joined in this discussion by Gabrielle Carruthers. Gabrielle is a tuba player who is based in Moncton, New Brunswick. She just graduated from the Université de Moncton, where she studied with Greg Irvin. Congratulations, Gabrielle. She'll be heading, off to, she'll be heading off to McGill in the fall to begin her master's degree. Uh, Gabrielle is a member of the East Coast Brass Quintet and has played in a number of orchestras in New Brunswick. And you may recognize her from last year's top 30 under 30 in classical music, the CBC feature. And Jen Steven is here as well. Jen is a tuba player and arranger based in Toronto. Jen and I have known each other for many, many years. Um, I will say it's been one of the nicest things about the Canadian Women's Brass Collective. It is, is that it's um, given Jen and I a great excuse to stay in touch a little bit more. Jen is the principal tuba player of the Kitchener Waterloo Symphony Orchestra, a gig that she won just before the pandemic hit. That would be a fantastic session of <laughs> what to do when you win a job right before a global pandemic. She's also a member of the uh, founding member of the Toronto Brass Quintet and um, is active as a freelancer and educator all over Ontario. So Gabrielle, I think you are going to kick us off. For sure. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about, uh, because I, I am still a student and uh, just finished my bachelor's degree. Um, I'm kind of Go, going to go in depth in um, the struggle in the summer, not only have students kind of lost our structure, um, but we also um, most times have a summer job on the side. Um, so it, it's kind of tricky to balance, you know, a summer job um, and also social life. Uh, if you're going back home, you know, you haven't seen friends in a while. Um, and then to keep your chops going as well, it's, it's a little tricky to, to manage. Um, so the first point that I want to kind of bring out um, is time management in the summer. It's not easy <laughs> when it's so nice outside. Um, and you know, you, your main focus isn't just school anymore. Um, you've got a job, uh, you wanna see your friends, um, but you also wanna keep practicing, right? Um, so there's a few things I picked up throughout my bachelor's degree um, that I found worked for me and I thought it'd be worthwhile sharing. Um, the first one is to schedule your time. Uh, my friends and I recently have started scheduling our social activities. So every week, once a week, um, we'll see each other. We block that time off. Um, so it's it's a good time uh, to have to kind of relax and sit back and you know put put everything of the week aside. Um, but it makes the rest of your time useful for practicing and uh, work. Um, and to also keep a routine during the summer is very helpful as well. So either going to bed at the same time and waking up at the same time, um, probably early both times, uh, and also eating at the same times roughly in the morning, in the afternoon, and in the evening, um, scheduling time to practice. Um, and that one, that last one can be a little tricky sometimes, um, depending on what you're working. So if you're lucky like I was, uh, I was doing Monday to Friday, nine to five. So it was a little easier to schedule every week. If you're doing more, um, if your schedule isn't as consistent, it's a little hard. But as soon as you get your schedule, um, if you can schedule in your practice time on top of that, it helps a lot. The next point that I wanted to bring out is um, how to stay motivated after a long time, like after working a long day. Um, it's not easy <laughs> when you come home and all you want to do is kind of just like relax and uh, you know it's nice outside oh I just want to go outside and read a book um, but if he, there are a few things that I kind of do that help me get into the practice room after work um, so the first thing is I pack a lunch and a supper with me uh, so two meals so that when I come back or I don't go back home 
which is kind of weird, but as soon as I hit the couch, um, it's game over. So I usually bring supper with me. And then after work, um, I go straight to my practice room. I eat either outside or uh, in my car. Um, and then that way I'm already here. So might as well practice, right? Um, another thing that I would do is sometimes practice before going to work. So because I only started work at like nine and I'm someone who wakes up pretty early relatively, um, I had an hour and a half, two hours before I went to work so that at least I had that down. And if I wanted to keep practicing after, I could, but if not, it's not the end of the world. I touched my instrument today, we're all good. Um, the other challenge in motivation during the summer can be that there's not much going on. You might not have any gigs, and especially I'm thinking of last summer and maybe this summer again, um, there isn't much going on um, as in gigs and whatnot. Um, so it, it can be a little hard to get yourself into the practice room. But if you say this time a year is actually perfect um, to set goals for yourself, things that you probably won't have time to work on during the school year, like um, basic articulation, um, maybe you need to work a little bit more on your flexibilities, on your double, triple tongue, but you have so much rep to work on during the year, you don't have as much time as you would have liked to work on those things. So um, make a list. Uh, that's what I do. I usually make a list of all the things that you know, I could have done better this year. Uh, maybe I should work on them in the summer. Last year was scales, so it can be really basic. Um, and you can also go back to repertoire or etudes that you really like to play, um, but you haven't touched in a while. And that can be a really big motivator to get in the practice room. Like imagine yourself playing that Bach that you really, really liked to play last year, the year before that. Um, you know, bring bring those books out again. I sometimes bring out um, my Conconi etudes um, and I ask Google to pick a number for me and then it, I just play whichever one because uh, I love those etudes. Um, another way to kind of get yourself into the practice room is practicing outside the practice room. That was a lot of practice, but <laughs> it makes sense when you think about it. Um, find books um, that might motivate you uh, to read uh, or sorry, to make you go practice. Um, so say like, uh, I, I have a whole summer list of books that help me, you know, get motivated and get excited to go play my dough scale in my practice room. Um, you can also watch others play. Um, there's so many live events going on lately with COVID and all. So it's a great time to go listen to other players from all over the world. Uh, you can also go research new music, maybe some music that you want to play later on. Um, also do some research. Research is fun <laughs> and it can be really um, interesting and to see other points of views uh, and new technologies and music. Um, and now more than ever, there are so many online master classes that you can go watch, um, either past ones or uh, live ones. A lot of them happen uh, virtually like this as well. Um, and even just coming to listen to us today, that this can help a lot to get into the practice room. Um, and also to help just motivating and setting goals, um, you can schedule lessons with your prof. Uh, I did this every summer of my bachelor's degree and it helped me have kind of like, a, okay, by this day, I should, you know, work on this. And, you know, it, it, it gets you, um, it, it pushes you a little bit more to practice if you have these lessons lined up and, oh yeah, I should probably keep my chops going. The last thing that I kind of wanted to bring up that is going to be a bigger conversation later is summer job opportunities. Now, obviously, um, as a music student in the summer, if um, ideally you want to have as much time as possible to practice, that doesn't always happen. Um, but the other ideal side would be to have a job that's directly in music. Um, so, and these are kind of all over the place. They don't necessarily mean that you're going to play and be paid to play. Uh, it can be like uh, for a ceremonial guard, um, but it can also be uh, some more administrative uh, side of things. Uh, for example, I worked with a local um, music, um, yeah, <laughs> program in New Brunswick last summer, um, organizing like a virtual uh, academy and a virtual virtual concerts. Um, so it gives you kind of a different perspective too uh, as to what kind of jobs um, we've got. Um, 
I see that there's a question. Should I answer it now? Yeah, sure. Okay, cool. Um, there was a question that says, what books, oh, I need to click on there. There we go. What books are you reading for motivation? Um, right now, I'm reading a book called uh, Music and Mind or Mind and Music, something like that. Um, and it's all about kind of the psychology that goes behind playing music. So I, I'm super into psychology. So it's um, I, I find it interesting, um, but there's also the uh, Arnold Jacobs Song and Wind. Um, that's also super motivating um, to read on Arnold Jacobs. Um, and also like, uh, I don't I don't know if uh, Jen or Karen, you guys know of any like sports books. Sometimes they can be very motivating um, as well. Um, yeah, so that was pretty much uh, my side of the thing. Um, but to wrap it up a little bit, um, yeah, it's a little hard to get her, uh, get in the mo uh, practice room in the summer um, because, you know, the structure changes a little bit. It, you get a little thrown off. Maybe you're a little tired um, after a long school year, especially a virtual one like we just finished. Um, but, you know, it's the summer it can be helpful to go back to your basics and also just to have fun um, with your instrument and just really enjoy um, being in the practice room. Thanks so much, Gabrielle. That there's, um, yeah, there's so much in there. I'm wondering, Jen, is there anything um, that you'd like to respond to in what Gabrielle said? Yeah, um, I, I think um, I'm hearing a lot, of, a lot of the same, the same things that um, certainly rattle around in, in my mind and, and that certainly did when I was a student and a lot of those things that have carried on throughout my career um, and, and its various uh, pathways. Um, one thing that I've always found really helpful in terms of, uh, you know, finding that motivation at the, at the end of a long day, um, which, you know, for me happened in the summers, but then also when I first became a freelancer, um, when I moved to Toronto, I had various jobs and some of them were very physically demanding and exhausting and the days were long. And then, yeah, how do you find that, that motivation to get into the practice room? And I'm someone who's very, very intrinsically motivated by listening. And so I do a, a great deal of listening on my commutes. And that started back then where I would be either walking or taking the subway home from work. And I would make sure that I, I was listening to orchestral rep or other styles of music or cello music or whatever. And then by the time I got home, I would just be raring to go to get in and 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 play, right? So that's that's been something that's been really, really useful for me. Um, and then also just, just um, to go back to your question about, about books, one when when you asked about sports books, one popped to my mind, and then I, I couldn't think of it. And it's not a sports book at all. Um, it's actually um, it's a book by Twyla Tharp. I don't know if you know who she is. She's a she's a um, a choreographer, um, and I love delving into books by other uh, other artists in different mediums, right? Um, and she has this amazing book called The Creative Habit, and it's it's just fantastic. I've read it and I have it as an audio book and I keep going back to it. And, and it sets up a lot of these same questions, like how do we keep ourselves motivated day after day after day after day? Um, so that would be um, definitely a recommendation um, for me. And I, and I should note that when, when this session is over um, and, and we put it up on the website, we will, we, we can put together a reading list if anyone's, if anyone's interested. Yeah, for sure. You know, and it's interesting that you bring up the Twyla Tharp book, which I have also read. And and Gabrielle, I was thinking about you talking about packing a lunch and a dinner, um, so that you don't have to go home. That you can just um, you can just go right to wherever you practice. And you know, this is a way. I'm going to talk about this in a few minutes. But this idea that um, we can plan to not be motivated. We can, you know, in, in a lot of situations, it's it's safe to it's safest to assume that we're not going to be motivated and to um, not, not rely on motivation to get the job done. So I thought that was just ingenious, Gabrielle, that you knew that it was going to be really hard at the end of the day. You knew yourself, so you just created a plan um, so that you didn't give yourself a lot of option. But to go and practice, I think that's super smart. And I also want to echo the... the um, reading books, you know, whether it's about, I, I'm sort of like Gabrielle, I, I really like psychology, I like, I like learning about learning. 
And um, starting when I was a student and all the way through to the present reading books about, um, you know, how we learn and how we stay motivated and um, whether it's in sports or other art forms is, has been um, really vital in kind of keeping me going as the years go by. Jen, are you ready for us to turn it over to you? Yeah, for sure, for sure. Awesome. Um, so I'm, I'm just kind of, kind of pick up where Gabrielle left off. Um, like I said, a lot of what, a lot of what she said has, has resonated with me. Um, so, you know, through the course of, of my, uh, of my career from a student to a freelancer, um, and, and now, um, into, into, um, having a, a position with an orchestra, um, I, what I've done over the course of the summer has of course changed and evolved. But one thing that stayed constant is the fact that I always really try to see it as an opportunity instead of um, as this big scary thing, like what am I gonna do? How am I gonna fill my time? Um, so I, I really like to think of it as a learning opportunity. And one thing that, that has really helped me um, is to yeah think about those things that you don't have time to do during the course of the year whether it's because you're a student or you know you're freelancing and so you're trying to prepare all this music whatever your life circumstances might be um what is it that keeps coming back to me oh i wish you know i wish that was a little bit better i wish i felt more secure with this or that um and one thing i found really helpful um, is I, I'm a big practice journaler, um, not not in great detail, but I do use that as a tool. And at the back of my practice journal, so I start from the front with my regular stuff, but then I have at the back um, a bring forward file. So that's all the stuff that I'm just going to write down and not worry about right now. And then when, when the time is right, when I have that time, I already have a list ready to go. Um, so things that I keep keep in there are, you know, after after every audition that I've ever taken, you know, I have a phone chat or a, or an email uh, correspondence with people on the panel, and if there are there are consistent things that come back about my playing that that I need to improve upon, those go right in the back. They go right in the bring forward file because maybe I don't have time to work on it right now, but that's a consistent thing that I can that I can look forward to, or um, you know, did I did I hear this amazing opera aria that I in immediately thought, oh man, that would sound great for tuba. <laughs> so that goes in that file and maybe I'm gonna, I'm gonna revisit that in the summer. Um, so that's just one way that I use to keep myself organized um, in, kind of a, in kind of a loose non-spreadsheety kind of way. Um, so um, I, I also try to ask myself a lot of questions. When I see these, these, these drier times coming up, whether it's the summer, whether it's uh, historically for, to, for me anyway, January, not much happens in January. Um, so those are, those are times when I start to ask my, myself uh, questions. So the first, and I think um, one of the most important questions that I always come back to is how can, how can I use my imagination to stay curious and to stay engaged. Um, I think it's really hard sometimes to stay engaged in our craft when there are no firm deadlines, right? But I think that we can really rely on our imagination and, and rely on, on our own experience uh, to create systems for ourselves, to, to create that engagement and create that curiosity. Um, it's a great time to experiment often, you know, maybe we want to tackle our articulation, maybe we want to, there's something about our sound or whatever that we want to work on. Um, and when we're not afforded this luxury of time, it's really hard to give ourselves permission to experiment and then say, oh, well, that didn't work. <laughs> you know, that was a week where I tried to go down a certain path and that didn't work. Because we don't want to waste that time, right? We don't want to lose that time. But when we have the luxury of time, that's that's an opportunity for us to experiment. And if it works, you can keep it. And if it doesn't work, well, you haven't lost anything. You've learned something, right? Um, uh, one very concrete thing that I find myself doing all the time um, in, in dry periods, I have a lot, you know, we all have a lot of etude books, I'm sure. And I tend to get, you know, so far through them, maybe up to a number 12 or 14 and then uh, and then I move on to something else. So I routinely will just pick one and and say, okay, well, 
the month of May is this etude book. And every day I do one and then, you know, the end of May, I've actually made it to the end. And that's another um, system that I've put in place where I don't have to think about it. I don't think, oh, what am I gonna do today? This is just, I've put that system in place and I'm not asking myself the question. Um, as Karen mentioned off the top, I, I really enjoy arranging. That's something I delve into a lot in the summer, not just in terms of, you know, sitting down at my computer and, and arranging solos or whatever, but also it's a great opportunity to workshop. Um, again, there's this luxury of time where we can try things out, we can experiment and uh, throw things out, go back to the drawing board, really work through things. And you can do that by yourself. You can do that with colleagues. Um, if you have a, a chamber ensemble, it's a great opportunity to get together and say, okay, hey guys, I've, I've arranged this piece. I think it's really cool, but you know, I'm not a trumpet player. Um, let's play this through. Just give me all your feedback. Um, and that can be a really great learning opportunity. Um, the other point I wanna make is that I think, um, and it, this is something I was thinking a lot about as Karen was doing her presentation in the previous hour. Uh, we put ourselves into this very um, stressful, busy situation, you know, in the fall and winter months often, whether you're a student, whether you're working, whatever it is that you're juggling in your life. Um, and it's, it's tough, right? It's hard. And we have to learn how to manage that in a way that is healthy and fulfilling for ourselves. And I think that the summer months can be a really great opportunity to learn how to handle those busy times better. Um, so, and again, this ties into what you were saying, Gabrielle, about reading books um, or, or discovering new things. Um, so a couple things that that I've done over the course of the summer, you know, I know that I know that when fall hits, often there's a huge stack of music to learn, and that's hard to manage. So sometimes I'll I'll pick a month and I'll pick an orchestra, any orchestra, and say, okay, I'm going to be a member of this symphony orchestra for this month, and I'll pick a month in their season that looks heavy, and I will prepare as if that was my life. You know, I'm going to play a concert in my basement by myself every Saturday, but I'm gonna do the lead up. I'm gonna learn all that music. I'm gonna listen to all the recordings and then I'm gonna perform it. And then I'm gonna start with a new one the next week and just see what it's like to prepare that vol volume of music. So when you're actually in that situation, it's not quite as much of a stressor. You know, you're building your you're building your uh, familiar familiarity with a lot of repertoire that maybe you, you haven't played or um, maybe is it hasn't been on on your on your radar. Sometimes we, we can learn all kinds of new music that way. Um, you're listening to a bunch of different orchestras. You're really um, pushing yourselves in terms of getting to that performance point, which I think in the in the summer is very easy to to play things and to try things out, but to never push ourselves to get to that that higher level where we would be comfortable sitting on a stage and performing it. Um, and I find that that's been a really great tool and a really fun tool for me. Um, to, uh, to practice doing that. Um, I, I use the opportunity in the summer to do a lot of listening. Um, I like to walk. I like to go on very, very, very long walks. Um, and so I'll just make a, a big playlist and, and head out and, you know, enjoy the weather, enjoy the summer sun with my, with my earbuds in and, and listening. Um, it's been a, it's a great opportunity to, to pick up something new, like, like doubling. Um, I know for a lot of my high school students um, who are transitioning from B flat tuba to C tuba, I generally will advise that they they just hold off until the summer, right? So that they can really dive in, learn those new fingerings. You know, um, when I started, uh, when I decided I wanted to learn how to play the chimbasso, I set myself up for a summer of learning the chimbasso, and that was just such a it was such a great summer. It was so much fun. And I could really dive into to learning how to play um, that instrument effectively because, again, I had the time. Um, in terms of other ways that we can, we can work ahead to manage our upcoming seasons, we can look at things like Alexander Technique or yoga or um, body mapping, all those things that can really help us manage 
our own stress levels and get more enjoyment out of our life when times are busy. The summer and um, and other kind of downtimes can be a really great opportunity to dive into those things and see what works for you, right? See what's going to fit and what's really, really going to help you. Um, and 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 finally, um, well, not finally, two, two short little, two other short little points. Um, I really, really like the concept of front end loading. And what I mean by that is, is doing a lot of the work as early as possible, because really we don't know what life is going to throw at us. We may be looking ahead to a fall. And, you know, if you're a student, you might be looking at what looks like a perfectly manageable course load and, oh, I'll be able to do all this. Or, you know, if you're a working musician, you might be looking ahead and seeing your season and thinking, okay, you know, I, I've got this, but you know, life throws things at you always. And we know that. So um, doing a lot of work ahead of time, whether that's preparing an upcoming season, getting through all the nitty gritty when you have the time, uh, preparing if you're in university, uh, starting right now to prepare for your uh, fall placement auditions. It's never too early to start looking into those things. It affords you the opportunity to be able to you know, call up your colleagues, call up your mentors and say, you know, I'd like to play this for you. Whereas maybe that scheduling is going to be really tough come September, right? When pe when everybody's busy, it's not just you that's going to be busy. Everybody's going to be busy. So you're, you're using that as an opportunity, not just for yourself, but also for, for building your community. Find people who are in the same situation, work together, play together, play duets together, listen to things together, right? This is a really great opp opportunity to, to build this wonderful community that we are so fortunate to have as musicians. Um, and, and finally, I think it's a great opportunity to, to get yourself inspired. Um, I think we all get inspiration from different, different places in our lives. So for me, um, I, it, it's mostly from, from being in the outdoors. I love to go hiking um, on canoe trips, all those things. And I think that those experiences inform me as a musician when I, when, you know, I don't have time to do those things. I, that's part of the experience that I bring to my playing. Um, going to art galleries, taking in live music, all those kinds of things. I think that uh, we can really see that as a place of value in the summer where we can um, maybe maybe my face isn't on my instrument, but I'm involving myself in some rich experiences that are going to come through the instrument when when I'm back at work. Um, so I think that that can be a really a really great you know ask yourself what's the life you want to be reflecting through your music and 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 really invest your time in building that life when you have the time to do it. Thanks so much, Jen. One thing that, that really struck me um, was when you talked about how, you know, in the summer we often have time to kind of like luxuriate in these more exploratory projects and experiment with our techniques. So to be a little bit less goal directed in our practicing compared to in um, during a season or during a school year when we're, when we're, you know, we're constantly having to learn new things. Um, and balancing that form of practicing with this idea that you can also use that time to um, really up your game so that you're better prepared to get yourself to that higher level. Um, I'm curious if you have any thoughts about um, how do you tell which is the right one for you to engage in in any given time in your life? Oh, that's a really good question. <laughs> um, you know, I think I'm someone who really, um, I have a history of over practicing of of kind of burnout um uh so for me it's it's been quite a journey to get to the place where i can say you know i'm gonna go into the practice room and i'm just gonna use it you know as a lab i'm gonna experiment i'm gonna and that's okay you know that's been quite a journey for me to get to because i i am such a goal-driven person so for me it's been kind of on purpose, trying to explore the other, right? Trying to trying to really force myself to step out of my comfort zone. With you know, for me, my comfort zone is 
you know, checking all the boxes, making sure everything's in time and tune, you know, like the, those, those questions, right? And so um, forcing myself to step out of my comfort zone and tell myself that it's okay, you know, it's okay to spend an hour or two just trying things out because there's a lot of value in that as well. Um, and again, you know, if we, we read what other artists do and how they, they hone their craft, I think that that's something that's common um, across the board with, with a lot of different art forms. That's awesome. Um, Jen, I wanted to kind of pick a little bit at what you were talking about uh, when you talked about body mapping and yoga and the Alexander technique. I think that's very a very good point to bring out. I'm a super huge yoga geek myself, so um, I discovered it a few years ago. And I find, um, I, I don't know about you too, but my brain is constantly working and it's hard to shut down and shut off. And sometimes even just in the practice room, just to focus sometimes. Yeah. Um, so I find like that, that kind of external, like um, instead of being in your mind, being in your body and in the moment, um, it, it helps a lot. I don't, do you do much yoga um, yourself? I do. Um, I'm not, I'm not. Um, yeah. I mean, I do. I do yoga a few times a week and I certainly find um, that it helps. I'm not a big, um, I guess, spiritual yoga person. Um, mm. I, I've spent a lot of time um, in working more in terms of mindfulness, taking taking courses on on mindfulness and doing that kind of practice, and that's been where I've I myself have found a lot of value again in calming down that inner voice and 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 just allowing you know allowing yourself to to explore and to to be who you are right because what we're trying to do is we're trying to be who we are through our instruments. Um, so that's the direction that I've gone more. Um, my journey through yoga and my continuation of yoga is quite frankly, mostly for physical pain. Um, and it's been incredibly helpful for that. And I continue to rely on it for that. Um, so I think we all we all find our own balance. Um, I also investigated at Alexander Technique for a while and found that it wasn't for me, but I'm glad that I, I did explore that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe I'll come back to it at some point. So um, yeah, I think, you know, we all have our, our different, our different uh, things that we're dealing with mentally, physically, and finding that right balance. I think that's something that can be uh, of great value when you have the time to delve in and again, explore and experiment. That's so awesome. Before I, before I got kicked off, I, um, <laughs> I, I really resonate with what you're saying, Jen, about me having to, the need to intentionally explore that sort of more this softer, gentler, more exploratory side. Um, and definitely I will say, Gabrielle, that um, yoga was definitely something that helped me with that is, is um, yeah, it's just exploring that side. And, and in my experience, that sort of, that built some capacity to then, you know, then work towards like, being the absolute best that I could be. But um, being in that mode all the time can be really depleting over the years. So finding that balance can be really helpful. I am going to um, uh, make a few, uh, say a few things about this subject myself. I'm gonna, I'll say if anyone was here in the previous session, um, my computer and my internet connection are not loving this experience today. So um, I'm aware that I am freezing and um, may get kicked off, but I know how to find my way back really quickly. So um, as long as my audio is good, we're just going to, um, we're going to pretend that I mean to freeze every few seconds and just go with it. So um, talking, I'm not going to, I'll talk sort of um, about some strategies that have really helped me dealing with things, not necessarily specifically um, summer projects, or, although definitely um, definitely when, when I encounter a, a time like a summer where I've got a little bit more time, a little bit more freedom to choose how I'm going to structure my time, some things that have been really helpful for me. So one thing that I have struggled with when faced with a big chunk of time um, that's a little bit less structured, both as a student and as a, um, as a professional now, is I tend to make a bunch of 
grandiose plan. So I have this big idea of what I'm going to do with this big, long, it's like a, a beautiful blank canvas of time. And, um, and then struggle to take full advantage of the time I have. That has been a, an issue for me. Perhaps others of you have also experienced that. Another thing that I've struggled with is having a lot of enthusiastic, a lot of enthusiasm about um, this improved me that I see in the future. So I might have a summer on my hands. I think I'm going to do all these things. And then I can sort of envision this new improved Karen at the end of it all. Um, and I'm very motivated by that, um, that image of myself. And I have a hard time getting as much enthusiasm or motivation for the um, actual behaviors on a daily basis that are going to help me get to that. And, and some people are the awesome, or, or sorry, are the awesome. Some people are the awesome. Some people are also the opposite, where they, um, they're really motivated by that vision of where they want to they wanna get to. That ultimate goal is the most motivating thing. Um, but other people like me um, kind of have to keep that um, big goal on the back burner. Um, it's sort of keep it in our peripheral vision and really focus on the sort of day-to-day -day things. So um, I wanna, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how I've focused on the day-to-day -day things a little bit better. But I wanna go back really briefly to this idea of self-compassion. Um, so some of you may have been with us in the previous session, but even if you weren't, um, we were talking about, about self-compassion and, and defining self-compassion as just sort of an attitude of support and friendliness for yourself. And it can be really helpful when you're, when you're, whether you've got unstructured time or not, but when you're engaging in a substantial project, um, to really frame that process as being supportive of your development and being an investment in yourself and what you value most, rather than as an opportunity to fix something that's lacking or deficient in you or your playing. Um, and it's a really subtle difference, but um, it can be over time, especially over many, many years, um, constantly feeling like you have to kind of fix or shore up um, something that you feel is maybe shaky or deficient is, is not as motivating as, as seeing this as an act of sort of care and support for yourself. So I found that um, really, really helpful myself. Um, again, I, I, for some of us, it can be really helpful to sort of put the big goal in parentheses. Um, and but don't let it be necessarily your main driver on a day to day basis. So I think everybody has a little bit of negotiation to do to determine what's the sort of ideal frequency with which to check in with our, our bigger goals. Um, for some people, keeping that in mind every day uh, and it is really, really helpful. For some people, it's it's more helpful to just kind of put that to the side and maybe check in with it every week or two, every month. Everyone's going to be a little bit different here. Um, and then what I, I really want to focus on, those are some sort of framers, but what I really want to talk about for a few minutes is um, this idea of discipline and motivation. I think that we often look at discipline and, motivate, and motivation as kind of these magical, mythical qualities that you either have or you don't. We feel really good when our motivation is high, and then we feel kind of rotten when our motivation is low or when our discipline is low. And... Um, I actually think, well, it's not, I, I don't think it, there's, there's quite a bit of evidence for this, that motivation naturally ebbs and flows. That's just kind of the way humans work, that um, motivation sometimes is high, sometimes it's low, sometimes it, it, sometimes we'll experience a period where we, where we're, we have a lot of motivation for many weeks, um, and then we think we've cracked the code. And we'll often have a period where our motivation is very low for many weeks or many months, or like an entire pandemic's worth. Um, so, uh, you know, this is, or sometimes we find it's like really up and down. Like yesterday, I like left out of bed and I did all these things I wanted to do, but today it was hard for me to get out of bed. And, you know, so all this is really normal. So I, I really think it's a mistake to view motivation as a prerequisite for doing the things that we want to do because motivation just is unreliable. It ebbs and flows for uh, many, many reasons for, because of external circumstances, um, also internal circumstances. Um, so even things like, you know, what you've had to eat, how much sleep you've gotten, 
all those sorts of things have a huge impact on motivation. So um, treating motivation like a prerequisite, I think, um, can be problematic. And you add to that the fact that we are designed to conserve energy, both, both physically and cognitively. Um, our brains and our bodies do not want to work any harder than necessary at any time. Um, and so when we notice that we're having a hard time getting going, it's not necessarily because something has gone horribly wrong. It's because our function or our system is functioning the way it was designed to function. It was designed to conserve energy. So um, like we were talking about with Gabrielle the other day where she has this awesome hack of at the end of the day, she knows it's gonna be hard to practice. So she packs a lunch and a dinner. So she sort of plans for the fact that it's going to be hard um, that it's going to be hard to be motivated, that she's probably not going to be motivated to work even more at the end of a day of work. Um, I think these are the terms that it's really helpful to think in, is how can we, how can we um, create systems for ourselves where, that are going to enable us to act whether we're motivated or not. Um, and then a, a cool thing often happens where once we get a bit of momentum, that itself is actually kind of motivating. Um, it kind of provides a little bit of fuel to keep us going. But um, if that fuel source dries up for whatever reason, um, or we really need something to sort of get us going in the first place, then it's, it's really helpful to have kind of an alternate fuel source. So I think rather than thinking in terms of motivation and discipline as sort of these personal qualities that, that you either have, and if you have them, then you're, there, we often add sort of a moral component to it that being really well mo motivated means you're sort of good. And if you're, if you're not motivated, you're sort of not so good and maybe a bit lazy. Um, I think that's not a helpful, not a helpful way to think about it because it's so variable. So if we think in term terms of how we can set up our schedule and in our environment so that we're more likely to engage in the behaviors that we want to engage in, um, this can help us, um, it can free us, uh, it not only does it help us actually uh, do the things we want to do, but it also has the effect of freeing us from some of these emotional up and downs, ups and downs that we have um, that sort of go along with our motivation. So we're, you know, as I mentioned a moment ago, we're, we feel really good when we're motivated, we feel not so good when we're, when we're not motivated. And if we kind of don't let motivation be the main motivator, um, we can sort of dial down some of those ups and downs. So um, there's many ways to do this. I, I really kind of like to nerd out. I listen to a lot of podcasts and read a lot of books about psychology and like behavioral um, science and behavioral economics and stuff. It's, it's a field that I'm really interested in and it's a huge field. Um, and I'm really just gonna touch on a few, um, just a few ideas that might be helpful, but I will also share some resources. So if you want to explore this further, um, there's lots of great places that you can go. So one of the cool things about taking on a special project in the summer is that we can take advantage of the fresh start effect. So this is actually a thing. This is why people tend to make um, New Year's resolutions, um, why it can feel very natural. It, it's often not just that we um, have a that the, the circumstances of our practicing change in the spring and summer, whether our work sort of um, slows down if we're um, if we're working, or in the case of a student, you're the the sort of um, circumstances that propel you along that go along with being a student kind of disappear. So um, those things can can cr create the impetus to do something different. But there's also this there's this sort of fresh start effect that's that's a real thing. Uh, that's been studied quite robustly. So this is, it's, it's a really natural time to take on something new. And so some ideas about how we can get moving that don't rely on motivation is um, there's something that's, that's called piggybacking. So a lot of times when I think about starting a new habit or changing my behavior um, or working towards a goal, I don't think as much about what I want to do. I think more about, I don't even think that much about how I want to do it. I often think about when I'm going to do it. 
So, you know, again, Gabrielle just gave us this brilliant example where it's going to, by default, it's going to be after work because otherwise, you know, she doesn't have time otherwise. Um, and so by packing a lunch or a supper, she's able to sort of piggyback the practicing onto her work day. So if you're having trouble um, getting into a routine where you don't, when you don't have as much external structure, piggybacking on it onto an activity that you already do is, um, can be really, really helpful. So I had this idea last summer, um, which I eventually abandoned, but I, I had this idea that I really, I wanted to learn how to do like a full push up all the way to the ground and, and um, come back up. And so I piggybacked that onto my, the time when I was waiting for the kettle to boil for my morning coffee. That was something that I already uh, was doing and um, I just like inserted this new habit in there and it was, uh, and, and, it, and I started really small. So I was just like do two a day and then it eventually actually grew into a much longer routine that persisted for many, many months. Um, and I just kind of like snuck it in there with something that I was already doing, which was super helpful. Um, you can use commit, commitment devices that either constrain your choices. So again, the Gabrielle packing a supper, um, example, um, or provide incentives or punishments uh, for if you don't do or you do do the, the things that you want to engage in. So rather than focusing on on punishments, there's all these websites, I'll just say a few because they're sort of crazy, you can, you can, you can, um, you know, there, there's websites where you can set it up so that if you don't reach your goal, it um, donates money to a charity that you really hate. So Jen could set up like, if I don't make it through this entire etude book by the end of the month, then you know this website's gonna dedicate like X amount of money to X charity that I don't support. Um, things like that can actually be very, very helpful. Um, but on a more positive note, engaging your peers, um, even through social media. So even things like the 100 Days of Practice Challenge can be really helpful in terms of, um, uh, in terms of, you sort of make this public commitment to be posting every day uh, that you're, you know, something that you're practicing, that can be really helpful. Um, I know a lot of people have been doing Zoom practice sessions where they um, get on Zoom together and mute and they all practice. And then at a certain point they take a break and discuss uh, what they're working on. So all those sorts of things, um, you know, we bundle those things, we sort of can bundle those things under the category of motivation, but. I think they're not really motivation. They're um, they're more sort of strategic. They're more systems thinking, more about how you're how you're setting up your life, setting up your schedule um, to make it more likely that you're going to engage in the in the activities you want to engage in. Um, sometimes when we set ambitious goals for ourselves, so like um, Jen was saying, playing all the way through an etude book, um, playing the entire season of an orchestra. Um, it, we set these ambitious goals, what can happen is that if we fall off the wagon for a couple of days, then there's something called the what the hell effect. And so because we've kind of like, we haven't managed to, we've, we've broken our streak, um, we just throw the, we, we just say what the hell, and we just stop, we quit, we don't do, we just give up on the project. And so again, this is something that's been studied really, really robustly, that if we build a little bit of um, flexibility into our goals, so um, two ways that have been studied and have shown to actually result in um, longer term behavior change. One is to sort of be, um, be more flexible in terms of when you, you do things. So Gabrielle had this great, she gave another great example of this where she was like, if possible, she sort of tries to get up and practice in the morning. Um, even if she has the intention to go do it in the afternoon after she's done school or after she's done work. But if she can get up and do a little bit in the morning, great, because then she's at least done something. So if for whatever reason she's, she can't do it in the evening, She's already done it. There's some flexibility. It's not, there, it's not rigid that it has to be after work every day. She's got systems in place that are going to make it likely for her to do it after work, but there's this sort of flexibility that could, it could happen at this time of day or it can happen at this time of day. This can be really, really helpful. 
The other thing that's been shown to be really effective is giving yourself a limited number of free passes. So Jen might be like, I'm going to go through, you know, this book has 31 etudes. May has 31 days. I'm going to do an etude a day um, for 31 days. But she might give herself like a three or five day grace period. Um, so that if she misses a day for whatever reason, it's a beautiful day, she wants to go for a hike, um, then if she hasn't derailed her whole plan. She's already built in a little bit of a grace period um, so that she does, it's not that she's fallen off the program, she's just like taking advantage of one of these things she's already built in for herself. And again, this has been, this has been shown experimentally to um, result in much greater behavior change and long-term stickiness of habits uh, when people build in this little bit of, of flexibility. Um, the other thing, uh, a couple things I wanna mention and then I'll, I'll wrap up. One is um, we, can, we can take advantage of our, we, we often talk about the sort of cognitive and psychological dimensions of these sorts of things, but there's, there's a neurochemical dimension to habit formation as well. In fact, it's it's a lot of it's you know the what's going on inside our brains and bodies is is uh largely neurochemical so we can um i like to call it microdosing dopamine um dopamine is we often associate dopamine with something that that is released when we complete a, a goal um but dopamine can be released every time we take a step in the direction that we want to go. And we can cause it to be released if we take a moment to acknowledge, oh, hey, I've made a little step on the, on the way. So Jen might be like, awesome, I've done week one of the Winnipeg Symphonies, um, February 2018 um, season. And like, and just to take a moment to actually feel good about that, there's a little bit of release of dopamine, and that sort of helps um, provide the uh, makes it more likely that we'll keep going. So we can be really, really strategic about how we um, manage that by just taking that moment to pause, um, get the little dopamine hit, and um, and off we go. And the one final thing I'll, I'll mention is. The and this has come up in both what Jen and Gabrielle said, and it's so important is um, finding your tribe, whether that's um, people that you can you can interact with. I was going to say in person, but you know whatever versions of in person we're able to do now, um, it can be people even um, on social media, but surrounding yourself with people who um, are into the same things that you are in uh, really helps us, into the same things that you're into really helps us move towards our goals. This is why even in the summer, sometimes we have these stretches of time that we can engage in these different types of projects, but what's often missing is the sort of social and professional support that keeps us, um, that sort of helps keep us motivated in the, um, you know, during the season or during the school year. So if you can sort of um, find some sort of group, um, whether it's online or in person or however that looks for you, to are who are engaging in the, in the same sorts of things that you're engaging in and have the same sorts of values and goals that you do, that can be tremendously motivating. So like I say, I'm gonna, th these are, th there's, a, you know, a dozens of other sort of hacks you can use to not rely on motivation <laughs> to, um, to get the job done. And if you're motivated, that's that's awesome. You don't feel bad about being motivated. <laughs> but I'm more concerned about the times when maybe we're not. So I'm just gonna leave it there and um, see if Jen or Gabrielle has any responses. Um, yeah, I think I think uh, your your point earlier on about um, about how motivation is is so unreliable. Um, and and I that really speaks to me, you know, and I think that my strategy over the years has been to really put systems in place so that I don't get to that place of decision fatigue um, so that, you know, it, it's, the decision has already been made. I don't have to make the decision. It's already been made for me. Um, and I find that, that that has really, really been helpful. Um, one really small little tool that, that I use for that, again, going back to journaling, I'm not a, I'm not a super um, 
you know, a super organized person, but I know what works for me. And, and at the end of a practice session, I, or as I'm working on things, I'll write what I'm going to do, what I'm going to start with the next day. So I know I don't even have to think when I sit down, I know what I'm going to do first off, or the first thing I want to work on, on this specific thing, because I knew it yesterday. So I don't have to think about it. That system has already been, been put in place. Um, and, and then in terms of, you know, being kind to ourselves, um, I've really been trying to embrace um, the the phrase, oh, well, but as a positive, <laughs> you know, not, oh, well, that sucked, but oh, well, and now I, now I move forward. Oh, well, what now? Right. And, and that has been a really simple and uh, effective way for me to just, you know, be a little bit kinder to myself in terms of, um, you know, letting go of that rigidity and, and keeping myself feeling good about whatever it is I happen to be doing. That's awesome. Um, Gabrielle, I'd love for you to share if you have any thoughts about this, but I, I also want to say for anyone who's um, watching us on the stream, if you've got any questions or comments or observations from your own experience, we would love to hear them. So you can put them in the chat and, um, and we'll answer them. Gabrielle, you got anything to add? Yes. <laughs> I thought it was really interesting uh, when you talked about like piggybacking or like, um, you know, having uh, external factors to like um, get us uh, in, into uh, the practice room. Like you, you used my my supper, uh, packing a supper as an example. Um, I, I don't know about you two, but sometimes um, during the summer, especially um, on the days that we're not working and we don't have anything necessarily to do, it is hard er to get you know uh, out outside of your house even sometimes. So. Um, I thought that was an interesting point. Um, and sometimes to help uh, with that, I find just scheduling a meeting like, oh, hey, let's go have coffee tomorrow morning, you know, with a friend. So it's, it's an external motivator to get out of the house. And then once you're out of the house, oh, well, might as well stop by um, and go practice uh, on the way back home, you know. Um, and also, Jen, you mentioned um, being more nice to ourselves, I guess. Um, <laughs> it's not easy. I'm still, I'm still kind of learning how to do that. Um, I have a phrase too, uh, and it's it's French, but uh, see, t'es capable. Uh, so um, I'm 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 capable of doing this thing. Um, not maybe not right now, uh, but I can do it. And I just have to, you know, uh, be more positive in my thinking. And it's just something I I, I mutter it to myself all the time. Um, but yeah, it, it was very very well said. I love that. I love that. And I, I, yeah, I like having little phrases that just kind of like help reinforce the kind of mindset and attitude towards ourselves that we want to be cultivating. I noticed there's a question in the chat. We've got um, about a minute left. So I'm going to let, I'm going to read the question on Jen and, and Gabrielle. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. So Charlotte is asking how much time do you take off the horn? Um, when in the summer do you time it? And what do you focus on when coming back? You could address all of those or parts of those. <laughs> Do you want to take um, this, one, Gabrielle, or I'm I'm happy to as well. Yeah, well, I I can take the first half, and then maybe you can take the second half. How about that? Perfect. <laughs> um, so, how much time do you take off the horn? Um, usually, right after like jury season, um, it's exam season, so that's usually the time when I'm not really on my horn as much, uh, school wise. Um, I'm not a professional yet, so I don't know what I would do um, in the professional world. Uh, but yeah, it's usually when I take the time off, and then uh, when um, I, the rest of the summer, I'm, I'm pretty much on my horn, unless I take like a week to go camping or whatnot. Um, and then, Jen, I'll, I'll let you finish the rest of that. Yeah, I mean, I I've evolved. <laughs> this question, the answer to this question, has definitely changed for me over the past uh, twenty years. I would say I used to not ever take no days off. You know, very rigid, and and again, in terms of uh, building me as a human being and and wanting to put that out through my instrument, I, I've created a bit more leniency there. So I do take time off when it's valuable for me. You know, when when I'm going to go on a canoe trip with my family, or when I want to spend some some time with with my family, my, my parents and my sister, things like that, I will take the time off because that's really valuable time. When I come back, um, I love going back to the basics. I always feel like I come back stronger. And again, I really try to look at it as an opportunity to take that minute and kind of 
relearn um, relearn things without those ingrained kind of bad habits. So I, I do think that it can be really valuable if, if you're looking at it as an opportunity instead of, um, you know, in, instead of as a hindrance. Yeah. Awesome. Um, I think we need to wrap it up. Um, it would be lovely to keep talking about this all day. Um, but we're hoping we're taking about a 15 minute break and then um, I'm looking at my clock. I'm trying to do the time change. I think it's at 3.30 Eastern time. We'll be back. Um, and we've got, we'll be joined by some other panelists and we're going to have a little discussion about career diversity. So we'll be exploring ways to diversify your career both within music and outside of music and um, what some of the challenges and the benefits of doing so might be. So we hope to see you back here in about 15 minutes. <laughs>